thanks everybody for coming out. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me okay? This is about how I'll be speaking. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, Chesson, Chesson Hill. Can you hear me? Chesson Hill is served by two railroads. And uh, I just picked up those timetables a few days ago. These are the most recent ones. And um, Chesson Hill East and Chesson Hill West. And we'll be looking at both lines and uh, introducing a cast of characters along the way. You'll see people like Frank Furness, Franklin B. Gowan, Henry Howard Houston, and others, uh, Washington Bledon Powell, various architects, and so forth. Um, what's <laughs> interesting, I checked the timetable recently, and the amazing thing is it hasn't changed that much in time. It's still 38 minutes from Center City to Chestnut Hill on the Chestnut Hill West Line since 1884. Nothing bad, it's just 38 minutes, that's what it is. Anyway, we'll move on. I'm gonna start with the Chestnut Hill East Line, and that's the former Reading Railroad. And even before it was the Reading, it was the Philadelphia, Germantown, and Norristown. And so if you hear me say PG and N, that's what I'm referring to. I'll probably use that to make it a little shorter. It's a much older line than the lines west. And it started long, long ago. In fact, in 1827, and this is even before there were railroads for the most part, Edward Bonsell, I think he was a druggist in Germantown, a kind of a businessman. He heard about an event that was very early in the Industrial Revolution, and that is an early railroad, 1827, up in what was then known as Mochunk, Pennsylvania. It's Jim Thorpe today. And they built a mining railroad called the Switchback to get coal out of the mountain get it down to the Lehigh River, they had a canal there, down to Easton, from Easton to Philadelphia, and uh, feeding the ironworks and Industrial Revolution. And he said, what, if only, he went up there with a friend of his, his name was Liebert, uh, a Moravian, also from Germantown, he said, on the way back, if only we could have something like that in Germantown, so we could connect with Philadelphia. At that time, Germantown, uh, was really almost a separate town, separated by four more or less open miles, and you had to use a stagecoach to go up Germantown Avenue. In any case, they plotted it out uh, along a route that would go from what we now would call Ninth and Green in Philadelphia all the way to the Germantown, and their original plot was to continue west to Norristown and then an abrupt right and go north up through what is now Plymouth Meeting and eventually reach the coal regions. Well, it didn't work out quite that way because once they were on the upper level of the Wissahickon Creek, the ground was way too rough, the grades too high, and so at a certain point, there was a decision made to change the route, and you'll see it just about barely a dotted line where the original route was plotted out. In 1835, instead, they opened the line to Norristown, and we're not going to go down that route. We'll just leave it where it is. And they never did reach the coal regions directly by that route anyway. They did it through other means. But instead, back towards Philadelphia, you'll notice they created something called intersection. That's actually become 16th Street Junction. And the line ended in Germantown right across from Vernon Park. Uh, which is still there today, and, and it was a stub end railroad, Philadelphia, G Germantown, until 1854. This is the celebration of the opening of the Philadelphia, Germantown, and Norristown, and that is in uh, 1832, uh, at first in the summer with horses, and then uh, the image on the right, you'll see it's from a very famous lithograph, uh, actually commemorating the event 50 years later, a little engine called Old Ironsides, and it was the first of every, the first locomotive built in Philadelphia by Baldwin. Uh, the interesting thing is that is Ninth and Green on the right, and it was an inn. It's not like a Victorian railroad station. It looks more like a tavern. 
And they used it for many years, till 1851. In 1851, they built what then would have been the largest railroad station in the Philadelphia area at 9th and Green, and that's the station that remained for till 1893. January 1893 is when Reading Terminal opens. But for those 40 odd years, 9th and Green was the, in effect, the center city departure point. There's a shot on the right in 1890, just before the end, but still very much in service. So you'll notice the trains are running on the street not elevated the way it is today, and the map pinpoints the location. Looking up 9th Street, steam locomotives, passenger trains, freight trains running right on the street. People actually lived on either side. There were also small industries in there and so forth. Much later, when it was eliminated, and uh, the photo on the right is what it looks like today. But in this, I have to tell you, today in some of the photos will be 1979. And that photo was taken in 79. That's how I got into this, exactly 40 years ago. So when I say, there's two types of today. There's today in 1979, and there'll be today in 2019. And I'll talk about those as well. Uh, for what it's worth, if you really want to go up to that location, it's where the Center City Commuter Tunnel emerges from underground and goes up onto the viaduct. That's the exact spot. On the right was the early engine terminal. That's about uh, 9th and Wallace. It extended between Wallace and Green. And on the left, a photo on the right in 1906, and only four years later, they elevated it. They built, put it on a viaduct, which it essentially is today. The engine terminal, of course, is gone. But when you ride the train up towards uh, Temple U and all those places, you will go right on that right away because that viaduct has not changed. Only the part that went into Reading Terminal is discontinued. There are very, very few photographs of stations on that early part of the PGNN. But this is one of them. Uh, now that is what in the earlier map was called intersection. Later, it becomes known as 16th Street or 16th Street Junction. You know, it's, it's on two levels. The street level is above, the track is down below. The map's a little later, but it does pinpoint it. Can you see 16th Street Station right there? Amazingly, that thing actually stood till, well, I have a color shot of it in 1965. And that's, to me, modern times. Um, but the photo in front of you probably dates from 1917. It was bypassed by then, but still standing, and it's one of the only clean shots. So you see the railroad swinging off to the left and then heading up towards what we now call Wayne Junction and so forth. Another of the early stations is the one on the left. That's at Nicetown. And Nicetown was a very important spot for one thing, that is where the Philadelphia, Germantown, and Norristown crossed the Philadelphia and Reddings line going down to the coal, uh, the coal piers at Port Richmond. And the PG&N used to pick up coal from there. And it gave them revenue because there were all kinds of industries running down 9th Street. In any case, when I got into this in 1979, I was very lucky to find one of the older stations standing. Now, the one on the right is Fisher's Lane. Sometimes it's called Fisher's Stone. Built not by the PG&N, but in fact, the Philadelphia and Reading, but in 1875. And I'll tell you, in 1979, it was hard to find a station that was from 1875. But nonetheless, there it is. And uh, the photo on the left is 79. The one on the right is actually after electrification. That's after 1931, you see the wires are up. But it's a nice photo. That was not, that has nothing to do with Frank Furness. That probably was designed by Wilhelm Lorenz. He was the chief engineer of the Philadelphia Reading at that time. And uh, he comes into play a little bit later, as we'll say. But he designed a lot of stations. As you can see, it was all boarded up. It was always grade separated, even in 1875. That's Logan Street going underneath. 
course, by the time I got there, it was all bricked up or, I guess, cinder blocked. And it didn't last very many years beyond that. Love that photo. You can see the woodwork and all kinds of stuff there. Um, moving, now, we're, what we're doing here, we're traveling geographically. I'm going to be moving north because what we really want is to have a thrust of the Cheston Hill Railroads, but you have to get there somehow. So the thing of it is, uh, before you get into Germantown, uh, one of the next, there are other stations, and I've skipped a few, like Worcester's, but this one I think is kind of interesting, Winga Hawking. And uh, it's very possible that Winga Hawking was actually at the centennial of 1876. If it was, it's either the kindergarten or the Swedish schoolhouse. Not a thousand percent sure, but it's very close. The photo on the right is pretty much as it was first set up in 1877 or 78 at the latest. The photo on the left is very near its end, about 1930. But what's really nice about this is, uh, oh, the photo on the right, 1917. And I'll wanna go into that a little more later. One thing I really like about this one, they walked inside and took interior shots. That's very hard to get, period, photographs, and they're sort of leaded glass windows with imagery. In fact, I thought I saw a, a figure of a child on the upper left that's a little bit hard to discern from here. If that's true, it, it may give a little bit of corroboration to the first theory. In any case, uh, there you are walking into time back to 1930. And there's nice timetables and ads, and I love the gray, glazed brick of the fireplace and so on and so forth. So it doesn't seem to have changed very much from the 1870s even till the 18, or 1930. A little further along, in 1979, I'm standing right there, and I found something that I call a piece of the true cross from medieval history. And this is the Main Street Station. This is the Germantown Station of the Philadelphia Germantown and Norristown, built in 1855 by the Philadelphia Germantown and Norristown, not the Reading. The earlier railroad built it, and I'm 99% sure it was the only station standing built by and for them that I've ever seen. I know some people are going to say, well, what about Shawmont? Shawmont is still there. It's down on the river line to Norristown. However, the problem with that one is it was built in 1826 as a private home and only later leased by the PG&N. So it wasn't built by them, but it was used by them. Nonetheless, there it is, 1855, but this is really priceless. The only photo I've ever seen of it when it was actually a railroad station during the Civil War, 1862, and it just says Railroad Depot. Some people call it Main Street Depot. Others call it Germantown Station. And it would have continued in use even beyond the Civil War um, till probably into the, at least the 1870s, although I have it on a map in 1885 and apparently it was still being used. There is the then and now, only the now, unfortunately, is 1979. It burned in early 81. Price. A little street called Price. Now, after 1902, in the photo on the left, it's still there, and it was used as a coal office from 02 till 1930. They were using it, but not for trains. And in the photo on the right, if you look, the track on the left is leading into where the Price Street Station was, and the one on the right leads you to Shelton Avenue and to Cheston Hill, the route to Cheston Hill. There's the map. You see the schematic one on the left, and from the atlas on the right, there was a little engine house in there uh, in number one, as you can see it on price. There it is in 1930, and its last lap, at least in any railroad usage, and in 1979. Now, 
moving on to Shelton Avenue, which then becomes the Germantown station in 1872, uh, at that point, uh, in, uh, actually in 70, the Reading Railroad leased the PG&N. We'll talk a little more about that later. And they built a brand new station uh, in stone right on Germantown, uh, on Shelton Avenue, rather, and a very rare interior shot in the ticket office. There you can see the layout again. It had a huge train shed. There's a steam engine way in the background crossing on the grade level. This is my favorite shot, taken in 1910. Looking across Shelton Avenue, train shed. By the way, you see that crossing shanty where the gate guy would have been? Uh, amazingly, that was actually designed by Frank Furness about probably 13 years later. He did everything. Question. Are we looking south or north in that photo? You uh, would actually. South or north? South, southwest. South, southwest, I guess, yes. So the. Yeah, into the city, that, that's right, because you're actually on the track which will lead you to Chestnut Hill. That's uh, on the right. There's a shot of a, it's actually a wagon crossing the grade, and they're in the process of elevating it, which is the way it is today. A complete grade separation and also electrification happens in the very early 30s. Now, I have a little schematic map there that I did 40 years ago because it was the handiest one I could do, and I have all the old stations listed. And right there at the junction, you see that they had extended the whole thing up to Chestnut Hill. And there is Germantown as it is later, even today, and the tracks we're on, we are on the track to Chestnut Hill. Now, this little notation was found down at Germantown Historical Society in the minute books, all handwritten, and that is the first time the word Chestnut Hill is mentioned by the PG&N Railroad. $100 appropriated for exploring for an extension of the railroad towards Cheston Hill. This is 1847 now. And by the way, at that time, Cheston Hill was not part of the city part of Philadelphia. That happens a few years later. Stocks were offered. There were business people. It's very interesting to read those minute books and also the annual reports because in the annual report, they spell out that what we want to do is develop an area, it's already beautiful visually. You should read it because it almost sounds like something that Henry David Thoreau would have written. In any case, they're talking about the vistas from Chestnut Hill and how you can see way out into the valley and so forth. And they begin the construction probably about 1850. And here is a early newspaper article talking about the construction part. And then several years later, it's opened. Here we are now in July of 1854. And they're telling you just a couple days before, uh, they have three trains scheduled, but amazingly within the week, they already added one or two extras. There was so much demand. And an early newspaper timetable. They reach the end of the road. Now this is 1854 and uh, when they reach the end of the road, you're in Cheston Hill. That's the Cheston Hill Hotel. And I want to read something. You're going to love it. This is the actual 1855 annual report. And I'm going to read a little paragraph to the board of directors, right? This is it. OK, here's what he says. Quote, the Cheston Hill Railroad was completed last year. That would be 54 to its terminus on the Bethlehem Turnpike, and the business on it, like that on the Germantown branch, has largely increased over the corresponding months of last year. The dividends have been regularly increasing and will continue until they reach those of our road. In the neighborhood of the terminus of this road, selections have been made, furnishing some of the most beautiful sites for suburban residences and a large number of first-class Cottages and mansions have been erected and others in process of construction. 
property has in largely increased in value and an unexampled prosperity appears to exist in this most beautiful and favored spot. To me, it's amazing that 165 years later, you could actually make the same statement and probably be correct. So the railroad was built for passengers, not for freight. They did some freight, but it's built ideally to get people who lived in Philadelphia, probably businessmen and so forth, to move up at first to have summer residences in Chestnut Hill and others all year round. That was the goal. So let's see some of the houses or at least the styles that they were using. Charles Taylor, uh, 1849. He already had built uh, a very large house. This is actually five years before they reached Bethlehem Pike. The railroad hadn't even been built yet. There's two basic styles you'll see, and that would be the Italianate style as defined by Samuel Sloan and others. And you'll see a lot of those. I got that out of an old paint chart, a Sherwin-Williams paint catalog, amazingly. Uh, Samuel Sloan starts his plans. I think it's called a model home, something like that, 1852. And some of these houses are still standing. I know what that is, that one on the left. Yeah, OK. And you'll see they've got like a lantern. You notice the context, the open land. There's the vista that they're talking about. You can look out in the valley uh, pretty much towards the Morris Arboretum. Um, boy, I know what that is, but I can't remember exactly. Yeah. So you've got Italianate. You also have Gothic style. And you'll see those. And... Um, Oh, yeah, that's Van Skyver's mansion and an interior, Victorian. So we're talking about houses being built before the Civil War, basically. 1850s, 60s, that era is where you see these. Here's a Gothic style again. Later, of course, we'll be seeing the Queen Anne. But you'll notice these early ones, Italianate or Gothic, mostly. Norwood Avenue. The Civil War does touch Cheston Hill. Um, and it happens uh, mostly in the realm of actually three hospitals affect the German town of Cheston Hill Railroads. Way down near Tioga Street in Philadelphia, there was a hospital. I think it was called McClellan. Right near Germantown, near the station, two blocks from the old city hall in Germantown, would have been the Kyler, and these are two letterheads talking about the Kyler Hospital. But the big one is up here for our purposes, Maurer Army Hospital. And the Maurer, the Maurer Army Hospital is located in what is now Justin Hill Village. And it would be from, from the railroad, from Stanton Avenue to the railroad, and from Springfield down to Willow Grove Avenue, if you can imagine that swath of land, it's now completely built over, of course. But in, in uh, prior to 1861, uh, it was sort of a, uh, like a park, I guess, not an amusement park exactly, but a place you could go, and uh, it was wide open. But there it is in a lithograph by P.S. Duval, done around 1862 or early 63. It opened in January 63. Very interesting, the architect is John MacArthur, Jr., later the same architect who designed City Hall in Philadelphia. And some rare photographs. Um, oh, huh, don't want to miss that. The inset on the right. Actually, if you look to the lower right in the lithograph, the, the balloon view, you're going to see what is a train in front of a little station. Now. There's a real dearth of imagery for railroad stations on the Chestnut Hill line prior to really the furnace era. There's not many. And of the Civil War era, there's almost nothing except this one. There's no two ways about it. That is a railroad station. It's actually explained in the legend under the print. On the right was the station, and on the left it says receiving for uh, wounded soldiers. 
So uh, that may be, in the end, the Willow Grove Station on the PG&N. Here's some interior photographs. Now, the hospital was torn down when the war was over. Actually, May 31st, 1865 is the last day. 20,000 wounded soldiers went through there. And of the 20,000, only about, I think, what, 270 died. That's not that bad. Not for then, certainly not. They had running water, hot running water, if you can believe it, flush toilets in 1865. Hard to believe, but they did. After the Civil War, um, a new cast of characters come in. Of course, the PG&N is still operating. But meanwhile, on the Philadelphia and Reading, and that's the big railroad, Franklin B. Gowan becomes president in 1869, replacing Charles Smith. And Gowan comes into the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad and his dream is to make the Philadelphia and Reading really the largest railroad, it, even in the United States at that time, but mostly to build a coal empire. And the lithograph shows a breaker up there in uh, Schuylkill County, and he created, you see, the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company, which is a parallel company to the transportation, the railroad company. But where Gowan uh, as interesting to us, mostly, uh, is where we're going next. He, he immediately begins to revamp the railroad. They start upgrading the stations. Uh, in 1878, they built Walnut Lane on the left. Uh, this is photo on the right. That's Gorgas Lane, very rare photograph. And Gorgas Lane was designed by Frank Furness. Now, that's in 84. And you can see the location of it. Uh, there was a grade crossing then. Frank Furness also is the architect for Mount Pleasant, which later becomes Sedgwick. That photo was taken about 19, before 1909, because it says Mount Pleasant. After that, it's Sedgwick. These are some walk around shots and on the right 1979 it's gone unfortunately and it went shortly after i took those photos and it was in kind of rough shape then the photo on the left in 1917 it was still being kept up even during the first world war 1917 on the left on the right about 1930 whoops Now, Frank Furness. The reason why Gowan is important for us in the Chestnut Hill connection is because he actually discovers Furness. That's probably what Furness looked like in the 80s, probably no later than 1890, late 80s, mid 80s. It really has to do with his discovery of Furness regarding the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. That was one of the biggest commissions <coughs> that was being done in 1876. And it was, it was built by subscription. These, this is one of the original drawings, by the way. The Academy, they have them all, the complete collection of original drawings. It's Furness and Hewitt, actually. Furness does most of the structure, and Hewitt does a lot of the sort of Gothic A lot of the exterior Gothic detail. It took five years to build the, uh, the, the uh, academy. Now, as soon as it's over, Hewitt goes his way, and he'll come back into the scene in a little later. Now, remember the coal breaker you just saw a few minutes ago? But here's a photo of one. This, is, this was called Greenback Colliery up near Shemokin. Uh, by the way, Molly McGuire's worked in there. I'm sure you're familiar with that and their connection with Gowan, and I'm not going to be going down that road, but here's the cool part. Uh, George Thomas, very well-known architectural historian, uh, has written a book, uh, well, he's written quite a few books on furnace, but most of all, this one is kind of interesting. It's called Frank Furness and 
architecture of the, <laughs> yeah, in the, in the age of machines. Yes, and it's very important, the age of machines, because the models that Furness looks at, it's not the Greeks, he knows about them, it's not the Renaissance, it's not the Romans, it's not even Victorian Ruskin, it's machines, it's coal, it's coal breakers, it's locomotives, it's the industrial models. And so what George pointed out in his book, he says, look at uh, Mount Airy Station. I'm going to show you a close-up of that, too. That's I, me in 1979 in its altered form, but let's look closely. There it is unaltered. Look at the shape of the breaker. Look at the slope running down and the way there's a, an almost, the words he used was a cascade of shapes, geometric shapes. And what he basically saying is that Mount Airy Station is really almost a model, a scaled down model of a coal breaker. Now, to be honest, in in George's book, he didn't show a photo, but I know what a coal breaker looks like because I've seen him many times. But I figured, no, nope, you got to see it. And there it is. Look at the shapes, and it basically mimics a coal breaker. What a great idea. And what's an even greater idea, there it is. Even in its altered state, you can see the similarity. But what's even better, he builds it about 1,000 yards from Franklin B. Gowan's own house, which he also designed. So it's sort of a visual pun. There's the photo as built in 1882. And by the way, in 1882, it cost $8,130 to build. Doesn't sound like much now, but it was a lot then. That's as built, brand new. And you're, oh, by the way, you're looking towards Gowan Avenue. You see that? It's still there, though modified, uh, but it wasn't modified yet in the photo on the left. That took uh, maybe in the 1920s. There's a close-up. I love that little kiosk with the stairway, a nice little detail. Almost an echo of an echo of a coal breaker, okay? You see some of the detail work. Now, you're looking at the roof line and say, ooh, what about that bend? The bend happens, uh, it's a little bit murky. It could be in the 20s, it could be electrification, but they, uh, this, they did something very strange. They actually raised the track level. That rarely, ha usually you depress the track level, but in this case they raised it probably to fill out a dip and make it a little easier to run the trains. And when they did that, they could no longer clear the roof. And they had an option. They're either gonna chop it off or they could bend it. And they bent it. I'm actually happy they did that because at least we have something but it's still there pretty much today. On the left, there's the original in 1882, and on the right in 2019, in July. 2019, just brand new photographs. My friend Chuck took those shots. He's sitting right over there, Denlinger. On the left, 2019, on the right, uh, probably 1910. And there's Gowan's house, and you can see the location of the Mount Airy Station right there uh, on Gowan Avenue and the railroad. There's a little street called Sprague that runs now right along there, and it houses. You notice there was a lake at one time, and you could see in the loop, there was the mansion, and it was called Kresheim. It later became a school, I think, for little kids, and now it's gone and built over and so on and so forth. 1877, I think, the house was built. Moving further north up to Mermaid Lane, more furnace, and uh, 1884, the station was built. Um, unfortunately, there's 1917 on the left, 1930 on the right, and look what they did. Right before they took out the grade crossing and electrified, they actually lopped off the shed. But Worse than that, it is now gone. That's one of the last photos ever taken. That's in 1930 as they're starting actually to take it down. And they changed the grade crossing. Um, what's interesting here, moving beyond Mermaid, I would say they separated the grade, excuse me. Uh, it's, a it's a little bit hard to read, but if you look closely, notice how close together the stations were located. Some of them are like just a third of a mile or half a mile. 
I also have a complete list of the stations from 1862, 1873. This is obviously much later in the 90s and so forth and so on. And there were name changes and there were replacements and so on and so forth. We're now moving up towards Winmore. Uh, on the left, looking north. On the right, looking south. There's the grade crossing. And at the grade crossings, you would typically have a flagman. He's got his flag, sometimes a little shanty. And if they had a crossing gate, it'd be hand operated with a crank. Okay, not, no flashers, nothing like that. Notice on the left, any railroad fans out here, hall signals. I have one in the basement, by the way. I had to get that in. Anyway, um, the grade crossing again, and now separated grade. That's done around 1930, completely changed. There it is, more or less today. That is today. Great shot. Uh, yeah, that would be, was that during the walk? Maybe not, I don't know. Beautiful photograph. That's the front today. So it'd be like 33 at the latest. That's what you would see. The last few photos of Winmore looking north. Now, what we're going to do is take a quick jump up. This is almost like looking at uh, a history of you know, World War II, the war in the Europe, the war in the Pacific. We're going to jump over to the other side. And there's a reason for that, because at this moment, while Furness is designing these stations, uh, Gowan hired him for five years, five years, 1879 to the end of 84. And during that time, he is a resident architect. That had never happened before. Always the chief engineer would design these buildings. But Furness is working there on salary. He was getting $250 a month. Later, they raised it to 350, okay? He was doing about two and a half station, or two and a half buildings per month. But anyway, while that's happening, on the west side, another railroad is being built, and the Chestnut Hill West is what we call it now. It's the Pennsylvania Railroad. You can see it color-coded on my little handmade map, the redding and yellow, the Pensy and red. They're hardly more than a mile apart, sometimes only a half a mile, and maybe even less. Now, the, uh, that line swings off. That's the main line to New York, by the way. That's the corridor. Shot made in 1891. And you can see a station in the distance. And there's the map. We saw this map before. You see that big track swinging off. It would be the upper curve, not the lower curve. The upper curve, Germantown Junction, they called it. So the main track's going to New York. That is now North Philadelphia today. After 1902, it's renamed North Philadelphia. There's a little bit closer shot. In fact, if you look very carefully, way to the left, there's the old intersection station right on the edge of the photograph. You see that? 16th Street. Still standing, obviously. A little connection to the, to the Reading, but there it is, uh, right in the middle of a Y, Germantown Junction. Now, the idea for doing this really comes from Henry Howard Houston. He was, uh, he was a director of the Pennsylvania Railroad. He wasn't the president, he was a director. He had originally been in freight. Years before, he was in iron making, he was in steamships, he's in oil, believe it or not. He's very involved in the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, you can check out Houston Hall, which is still there, named for his late son. And he hires Washington Bled and Powell to design the stations on the new line. And there's his sketches. Those are apparently are the original sketches, upper left, Queen Lane, the, the one in the middle and on the right would be Chelton Avenue on the grade level. That would be the Pennsylvania Railroad's Germantown. And on the lower left is Chestnut Hill. And on the lower right is the only image I've seen of Wissahickon Heights, now St. Martin's in its original format as a one story, not a two story, which it is now. These are photos as built. They were built as one-story stations. 
And so this is right when they're new, and that would be about 1885. The only shot I've ever seen of Shelton Avenue on the grade level, stone, some wood, shingle, stone base. Uh, that lasts till uh, maybe 1918. And you can see they've already put the concrete in to change the grade, which is the way it is today, and not long after it went. Now, what's interesting about these stations, <clears throat> there's 10 stations on the line if you don't count, 10 by Powell, uh, Germantown Junction is done by somebody else, that's really on the main track and that's the beginning of the junction. But of the 10 stations on the Chestnut Hill line per se, they're all designed by Powell, seven of them are all of the same design, okay? And that would be Tuppelhocken, Upsall, Carpenters, Allens, uh, Highland. Um, yeah, I know I'm missing one or two there. Anyway, and three are one of a kind. Here we are after they were made second story, and that happens in about 1890 or 91. So there, for five years, that's all, five or six years, they are single story, and then in 1891, they decide, no, it's better to have the station agent move in there with his family. You can keep an eye on the place and so on and so forth. And so they are made into little kind of apartments, as it were. Postcard from 1906. Uh, we have Upsol. There it is in uh, 1979. I, I think that's my father, believe it or not, underneath. Gone now, unfortunately. But he was with me that day. I'll never forget it. And on the left, there's Upsall back actually in the 60s. But this is my favorite shot of Upsall. It's why it's full frame. That photo was probably taken somewhere in the mid 90s, 1890s. I know the locomotive was built in 1889, and the station was made two story in 91. So a few years after that, great shot. It's a P class engine, actually, D13, I think. or. Yeah, anyway, uh, this is Carpenter's, but the reason I'm showing you that, look at that chimney. It looks almost like a steam locomotive smokestack. Now, that's supposed to be done by people like Furness, but here's Pal doing the same thing. Kind of interesting. Love this shot. This came out of Liz Jarvis's book. This is wonderful. Carpenter's as a one story, which means it's got to be before 1890. Now, you'll notice there's already a steel girder bridge there, and that brings up the point. The Pennsylvania line it was built, remember, 30 years after the Reading line, or the PG&N line. They already had eliminated most of the grades, except maybe for Chelton Avenue. So they could move a little faster, not as much hassle with uh, pedestrians or traffic that way. Here's Allen's Lane on the left, as built as a one-story. Only the orientations change. Sometimes they're high up, sometimes they're low. That's really the only difference. And on the right, today, uh, notice the crossover bridge. That was built in 1912, but in the postcard, they hadn't put it up yet. That's in 1906. 1979 on the left, and today, it's in better shape actually now, by far. 1979 on the left and 2019 on the right. It reminds me of the kind of bridges you see in a Hokusai, like a Japanese woodblock. You know those arch bridges, if you're familiar with those? A little beyond Allen's Lane, not very far, just a few hundred yards at most. Uh, and by the way, there's the sign. You'll see a very strange mm, white marsh. That's actually a branch that was built all the way up to uh, was Ivy Hill, I think. And it was, it's near where the turnpike is now. That's Broad Street Station on the right, and that's how they would use these signs, right there at the train gate, metal signs. There's the map, and you can see the offshoot that's the entire line, by the way, Chestnut Hill line, and also the, what was called the Fort Washington branch. And they connected with something called the Trenton Cutoff, which was done to, as a freight bypass. In any case, down near the junction there, as you begin to circle around, 
you see the curvature, and there's what in the old days, this is now the new Covenant campus, and, and when, it was, when the railroad was built, it was called the, the, school, the Deaf and Dumb School. Is there a different name? I don't know. The buildings are still there. And of course, the, the railroad has been abandoned for many, many years. The last passenger train ran in 52. And after that, they, it was pretty well downgraded. But you can still see remnants of it. If you follow the pole line on the right, you can see where it's going up towards Germantown Avenue. But for our purposes, how many people recognize that? Does anybody here recognize that company, the Matchbook? Aha, St. Martin's Coal Company. Here it is. It's, the building is still there, and the reason I show that, uh, the bridge, the photo on the right was, is now, in July, and there's an old shot, and that's the last easy to see remnant of the Fort Washington branch. They just closed the diner, by the way. I think you all know that. Trolley stop diner, but there it is, Germantown Avenue, and it's kind of almost a gateway to Cheston Hill, which is sort of neat. A little beyond, we have the Crusham Valley Bridge. And uh, on the left is a very old photo. That's the original bridge. And the shot on the right, it's hard to see. It's, it's concrete girder now, uh, replaced not that long ago, actually. That's me in the blue shirt trying to hack my way through some of the greenery there. Just a little bit beyond, we'll see a shot of that a little later, a, a much better one. That is what we now call St. Martin's Station. And even in this photo, which was shot in 1912, it's St. Martin's, but it was originally Wissahickon Heights. And Wissahickon Heights is, in fact, the name of the development that Henry Houston planned, the planned community. 1979 on the left, 2019 on the right. Remember, it was mixed at first, and it was one story. And later, they extended it with a brick second floor. Uh, there's a shot actually through the window. But I love this, the fireplace. And there's some tile work in there. And the reason I put Charles Locke Eastlake's book, that's a very important book for architects to look at, or anybody interested in furniture or interior decoration or whatever. This is the American edition, 1872, which influenced everybody who was anybody in that time period, even including people like Furness. And one of the neat things is, now, that's not exactly the same plan that they're using, but they had tiles above and below, and that's a page out of that book. And they show you tiles, floor tiles, uh, decorative designs that could be used, and sure enough, the influence is there. Now, Powell designs the stations, but the development is done by the Hewitt brothers. George, that's George there on the right, and his brother, William, who I unfortunately do not have a photograph of. And that's Henry Howard Houston, and so what Hewitt does is the hotel, the one we're in right this minute. Now, of course, the academy, right? Later, it becomes a school. Uh, it lasted as a hotel maybe 14 years, 15 at most. Uh, 1884, that's, that's built. This building is built even before the railroad stations were finished by one year. So the hotel is 1884. The stations are 85, at least in their first form. Then you have the cricket club, and then the, uh, I think, 86, and then you have the church, St. Martin's. This is the hotel after it's a school, around 1903. And I did a walk around here with my friend Chuck, and it's just terrific. It just looks like it did in Victorian times. Look at all this really nice woodwork that the Hewitts did, and it just looks great. I love these little details. We just walked through that doorway a little while ago. Yeah. 
Now, Chris, this is more Queen Anne style in a sense. I mean, there may be some other offshoots to that. Some of the open land at first, because, you know, Chestnut Hill West, the whole area is Houston's. Some of the first houses going up and land still in between. Beautiful shot of the church. Um, the Cricket Club, and by the way, that's the 19, that is the 1886 Cricket Club, which burned in 1909. Later it was replaced by, uh, yeah, the new one, it's still there. In any case, St. Martin's in the field, or St. Martin in the field. Interior, great. By the way, one of the reasons why Houston liked the Hewitts he thought they were really good at ecclesiastical type architecture. They, he loved the Gothic effect and so on and so forth. And it just doesn't get any better than that. Uh, that would be uh, actually one of the sample houses, Savour, I believe, right? So this starts the project of between one and 200 houses. Some were built to sell, some to rent. And of course, the really big one, 1886, is Drum Moor, and that is uh, Houston's own house. The garden is actually added in 1930. And on the left, his partner who helped develop this, also Henry Welch. And where you see the two gateposts that almost look like rooks in a chess game. And on the right, that's George Woodward's house. And Woodward was married to Gertrude, who was the daughter of Henry Houston. Okay. And in fact, they're the ones that changed the name of Wissahickon Heights Railroad Station to, in fact, St. Martin's. Now, during this time period, the pre remember, they're not the president of the railroad. They're directors. But George Roberts is the president. And one of the interesting things about this, there's a, you know, there's a lot of Gaelic names, you'll notice, that come into this. And it happened, and they'd already done that on the main line. In fact, it was Roberts and really his wife who renamed some of the stations down on the main line, like Ballakinwood, for instance. They come from old Irish, Welsh, and English baronial estates. And they were doing the same thing here. And if you were to take a train from Philadelphia to go to Chesson Hill, there's where you would leave at that time. Broad Street Station, this is the first part of it, designed by Wilson Brothers in 1881, opened at the end of 81. And you can see the shadow of City Hall, okay? And you're looking west, Filbert Street, that morphs into JFK Boulevard. You'll notice if you look in the foreground, those little trolley cars are in fact cable cars. Philadelphia had cable cars in 1889 when that shot was taken. And on the track level, they had smaller train sheds and some of these trains are pulling out of those sheds. Maybe one of them could even be going to Chestnut Hill. You'll notice City Hall in the background. There's another photo I have. I didn't have it here, but it shows cranes and derricks still up on top of there because they hadn't finished City Hall Tower. But what's interesting about that is the guy who is working on City Hall Tower at this moment is no longer John MacArthur Jr. because he had already died. It's really Washington Bled and Powell. So from 1889 to 1901 when they finished, it's Powell who's working on City Hall. Uh, after he had done the Pensy stations on the Chesson Hill line and other things too. I love this. Uh, that's not the very first timetable, the bigger one, but it's the same summer of 80, 1884 in August. You can see all the stations. But what's more interesting, Strawbridges in Clothier in Philadelphia. I'm sure many of you remember Strawbridges. But in 1887, they offered these little timetables, probably for women shopping in those days to Chestnut Hill. You go, you live in Chestnut Hill, you come down to Strawbridges and shop, and there's a little pocket timetable. A few years later, they enlarge in Broad Street Station. They add to it a 10 or 11 story building on what they already had, and this one, it's Frank Furness is the architect. 
that photo taken in 1913, only now you're at City Hall and you're looking towards 15th Street or Market Street. And as a matter of fact, 15th Street actually went through the building. So it's much closer to City Hall than the plaza is today. On the track level, they built a gigantic train shed, 306 feet across. It's probably the largest clear span, at least in the United States. That stood till 1923, but the station itself lasted till April 52. I will tell you, I just about remember it. I think I know Frank Tattnall sitting right over there, and I know he remembers it better than I do. I only saw it as a little kid. I was very small, but I did see it. In any case, uh, okay, so you take your train, you're going to Chestnut Hill. The next station is Highland, and by the time that color shot was taken, that's all there was, a, a little uh, shelter shed. It was on the south side of the railroad, but there was a grade crossing there, and that's the only shot of a steam engine right at the grade crossing. Later, there's an MU car. But there's what it looked like, at least in its two-story guys. But it was the first one to go. Actually, it went down either in 1917 or 18. That's when the Pensy electrified, too. But concurrently with that, they raised Highland Avenue. And so there was no room for the station, although the Victorian house is still there. You can see it on the right and in the black and white. Coming into Cheston Hill, just a little beyond that, there's a cot, and then you come into the yard, and on the outer end of the yard, they had a nice turntable there, a turn of locomotives, train coming out. You're looking on the left towards Germantown Avenue into the yard. Uh, the map is from 1910. You could just about see the turntable, like a little bulge down there. I since found a better map. In any case, there, you remember Powell's sketches, right? Look how closely he adhered to his own sketch. Uh, that's a photo taken really some years later as built. There's a postcard probably from around 1907. The shot on the right, uh, I was there with Chuck. We took the shot. He said, well, where shall we stand? Well, there is no place to stand. Everywhere there was a tree block again. It's kind of a shame. But in any case, we were trying to duplicate the uh, postcard. Um, on the right is 1979, and on the left, that's practically as built. That's in the late 80s, with the train shed. And this is from the, whoops, did I, where's the train shed? I thought I had a big shot of the train shed. There it is. Parking lot and up on Germantown Avenue, because when you're on Germantown Avenue, that's what you see. Amazingly, that is in 1979 on the right. Well, 40 years later, it looks the same way even now. But this is very rare. It's the only photo I've ever seen of the iron train shed. And, and under the shed, that stone wall there is uh, the retaining wall under Germantown Avenue. You notice there's grass and wooden planking and so forth. Oh, what the heck? Woo. Wait a minute. Okay. There's a D-16 actually sitting under the shed. Not a great shot, but it's the only one I've ever seen of a locomotive actually sitting under the shed. 1970 on the left, the 30s layout in electrification days. And there's the then and now that I love to show. That's in July on the right and in the 1880s on the left. Same shot, same spot, slightly different format. And very interesting. The, we are now into a, a feast of some color shots by Frank Tattnall. He's sitting right here on that shot on the left. By the way, if you go into the Conservancy, as soon as you walk in the door, you're going to see that beautiful Pennsylvania Railroad sign, gold leaf on wood, gold leaf, not paint, right over the doorway. and. Uh, Anyway, it's wonderful, but these were shot by Frank Tattnall, and they represent the age of electrification. And these are the MP54 cars that they used from 1918 all the way into probably the 1970s, actually, early 70s. I remember them in 73. Ah, oh, even better. From here, uh, Chestnut Hill or uh, Mainline? The system, system. The system wide. 
So they, they were very old cars, very sturdy, steel, riveted, okay? Some people complain, oh, they're bumpy and this and that. They worked. In any case, uh, these are all about 1960-ish, I guess. Allen's Lane on the left. Uh, Chestnut Hill, uh, look at that, beautiful snow seat. Frank was there at the time in color to really record the age of electrification, and so that's what I wanted to feature. Look at that shot. That was the whale. That was during the strike. The strike in 60, I remember that. Um, up on top of the Cresham Valley Bridge, the original bridge, there's the cut. On the right, it shows you the beginning of the Fort Washington branch just barely beyond the car in the shot on the right. You can just about discern that. Above, whoops, above Allen's Lane. Just about see it. Yep, right there. That's the cut near Highland. I'm not sure about the one on the left. Where would that be? Hard to say. That's St. Martin. St. Martin's. I think the photo on the left is 57, I think you had told me. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's even a little carnival that they had at the Chestnut Hill Station, amazingly. You can see the Ferris wheel there. Highland, and on the right, St. Martin's. But I just had to feature this one. I mean, that is absolutely the prize-winning photograph. If, if just one photo says Pennsylvania Railroad electric era, which was from 1918 even till now, that typifies it. You've got it all. The snow, you got the gold leaf on the sign, the original Pensy signs, February the 6th, 1961. Okay, we're going to finish up by, by going back and finish up now on the Chestnut Hill East Line. We left off, if you remember, uh, just below Graber's, and there's a little turning. You just about see the turret in the background. That's Furness at his desk, probably in the late 1880s. And um, I mean, you could have a whole slide lecture easily on Frank Furness. Books have been written about Frank Furness. And it's very hard to resist talking about him. Uh, you know, a very young Lewis Sullivan once worked for him in the summer of 1873, just for a few months. And he had to let him go. And the day he let him go was the day Jake Cook banking firm failed, triggering the panic of 1873. It would be the equivalent of the fall of Bear Stearns, if you remember that, in 08. Well, in those days, he said, you've done a really good job, but I'm going to have to let you go. But one of the things he had learned from Furness is basically the idea of form follows function. This, I guess, would be his masterpiece, and we're lucky to still have it. This is as built in 1883. And, I, you know, I was talking to, uh, or not talking, but Rick Bates sent me some, a very interesting idea. This is Graber's Lane. And it's not very far away. Uh, as built, you'll notice single track at that time. The double track happens in 1902, but at that time it's single track right into the Chestnut Hill yard. And look at that wide wooden planking. And also it's a, it's a kind of a middle tone. It's not the chocolate and vanilla we're used to seeing. I'd love to see a color photo of what that looked like as built, but even so, that's just a close up of the plank. This is a little later, but not that much later, maybe about 1910. Ah, the gardens, very important. You'll notice how beautifully manicured that is. The railroad did that. They did it, in fact, to most of the stations. And they had greenhouses with professional gardeners located down at Wayne Junction, growing plants and flowers, cana lilies, all that stuff, not just for Chestnut Hill, but the whole system all over the Reading system. They, they ha I saw a photograph of a fleur-de-lis pattern of flowers at the Reading Outer Station on the old main line and many other places. So this is a close-up. That shot was made in 1914 just to show you what the gardens may have looked like in the terrace and so forth. Uh, no, what, uh, the reason why the station, a lot of them were built in 1884, it was actually in between two bankruptcies 
Uh, we could talk about that another time. But they had the first bankruptcy ended in early 1883, and the second one began in the middle of 84, and you'll notice that's when most of the furnace stations on the Chestnut Hill Line are actually built. Be interesting to pursue that idea. Now, I uh, just want to show you something. This is kind of where I came in. That was shot in September 79, exactly 40 years ago last month. Exactly 40 years. And it was lopped off, as you can see. Other than that, the station was pretty good condition. But the shed, the poor shed was gone. And we're trying to figure out when. It's sometime after 1960 but before 67. Somewhere in there, whether storms, wind, rot, all of the above, they took it down. And I, the greatest thing here, I happen to, uh, you're all probably familiar with the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion down in Germantown. Well, it was acquired by, uh, I guess, Chesson Hill and Germantown Historical acquired it? How did they acquire it? Anyway. It was newly restored in 1978, and the first two rooms were open right around Christmas time. And my wife says, oh, we got to go see this, a Victorian house. It's going to be great. They're going to have a reading from Dickens. So sure enough, we shoot up there right around Christmas of 78. And I walk in, you know, and, and there it was, all the Victoriana. However, there was a little table there, and there were people. One of them, I think, was Skip Lynch, architect, Elizabeth Holloway. There may have been one or two other people saying, please help us. We want to restore the, the shed at Graver's Lane. Well, I couldn't resist. I violated the rule of when I was in the Army years before, never volunteer. I said, yeah, I've got some stuff. Uh-oh. So anyway, what they were looking for specifically were drawings of the shed. There are no complete drawings of that station that have survived. Uh, only that. That's just a general arrangement drawing. And I had that thing. And I showed it to Skip Lynch. He said, mm, not good enough. What else you got? I said, well, I got a terrific photograph. It's a glass plate original from 1884, and this thing is razor sharp. He said, let me see it. So I brought it up there. I met with him. He puts a jeweler's glass. He said, great, we can use it. And remember, no computers. There's no Photoshop, nothing. Only ink on linen or Mylar maybe, and he did it. He did a beautiful drawing of the shed, and he really made it look like this, and you'll see it today. So they had the footings. i just show you the difference. In 1979, it had just sort of tar paper shingles. There's the original. We're actually almost back to that now. But look at that little ventilator up there. It almost looks like a cuckoo clock. That's Furness. I mean, Furness just made this stuff out of his head. He's doing sketches, and he allowed flights of fancy to take place, a little like Klaus Oldenburg in a way. Love this photo here. That has got to be one of my favorite all-time shots. Great job. Uh, ambient effect. I don't know who took it or even when, but that's got the mood of old railroading, you know? I mean, that's, that's really, it doesn't get any better than that. By the way, even now, that photo was taken in July. There's some restoration going on yet again because it's an ongoing thing. You see the old chamfering and stuff. They've sutured out the bad wood. They put the new wood in. That's just a close-up of the original roof. Much more complex than what we have now. 1970, I guess, in the winter. It's just a nice shot. I took that shot 12 years ago uh, when somebody was living in there, which is probably the best state of affairs. This is today, but that's to celebrate the woodwork. Was somebody who's actually living in oh, the yeah. house? Yes, they were living there. You can't buy them. You can rent them. You can, you can rent. So I'm not sure what the ins and outs of that. Love this shot right here, 1920 on the left with a camelback. And there's Chuck's shot. We were standing on the bridge. I see the train. I said, ready, ready, now. Hit it. And I already knew what that photo was going to be like because I, I had the, uh, the black and white one. So there it is. Separated. What are we talking? 90, uh, my God, 98 years ago. My God, is it possible? 99 years ago. Um, today, there it is. Somewhat work being done. 
And this is rare, and, and what this reminds me of is the idea that not only is every Frankfurt furnace station different. I should have gone into this before, we'll do it right now. When Furnace was hired, no two stations he designed were the same. He doesn't replicate. Everyone is different. Mount Airy doesn't look anything like Winmore, which doesn't look anything like Gravers, and so on and so on and so forth. And that's all of the system, by the way, even up in the coal regions. They're all different. Whereas the Pennsylvania Railroad, out of 10 stations, seven are identical. That would never happen on the Reading. And the theory was, maybe Gowan said this, or maybe he didn't, but the idea was, you don't even need a sign to know where you're at on the Reading. Not with Furnace. Not in his five-year period. You can tell by the building itself, oh, that's a Reading. Oh, this is where I get off. So you would know that automatically. Not only are all the stations different, but in a way, even the building itself is hardly symmetrical. Almost no two areas are identical. Then and now, then on the right, and just in July. And then walking onto the shed again, really nice shot. That's the restored version in the 80s, and now there's some more upgrading being done. Now, while that's being done, more houses are being built. Only now we have the houses of the 1870s and 80s, 90s. Uh, Queen Anne style, uh, that's, I think, Theophilus Chandler on the right. Yeah, same house today, right? A little bit modified. This came out of an old Sherwood-Williams catalog. And that's just to remind you, Victorian houses were probably not white. They either have a dark color with light trim or light building with dark trim like this. This would be the Second Empire style. Uh, there's the urn and so forth, iron work. Uh, oh, I love that. Uh, that's furnace on the left, Hillbrow, which unfortunately is gone. And on the right, Wilson Air. Oh, what is that? Inglecott. Inglecott. Inglecott, that's it. He, by the way, he was 25 years old when he designed that. 25. Uh, yeah, 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 that's Lachlan's house, I know Greylock. that. Greylock, yeah, exactly. And I think that's called Maples on the left. Look at the ivy, you kind of like a romantic, I love this. Okay, Woodmere Art Gallery, and I mean, it almost looks like a John Constable painting in a way. That's still with us, alive and well, beautiful. Probably in the early 80s, I think. Now, in those years, if you took the train after January 1893, Reading Terminal. But I'm happy to say it's still down there. There it is. Uh, albeit, you are now leaving from underground from uh, Jefferson Station, formerly Market East. But nonetheless, you're basically in the same airspace. 12th and Market, 1893. Uh, Kimball is the architect, although Wilson Brothers did all the, did the train shed and the uh, girder work, I guess. That's uh, 12th and Arch, that's still there. You can walk into Reading Terminal anytime you want. But no bridge, the bridge is gone, obviously. That went out in 1984, and that's what it looked inside the shed. It's funny, it's luminous again like that now. Uh, they darkened it in World War II, it was all blacked out. But uh, when they did it for the convention center, you can sit there and have coffee if you're at the flower show, and it's bright like that, but no track. Only there's just scribing in the floor. Coming into Cheston Hill now, uh, there it is in 1930, just before electrification on the right about 1970. Uh, it's a map a little hard to see, Bethlehem Pike there. And that's the old station. This was built in 1871. This is right after the Reading leases the PG&N, okay? They leased the whole thing for 999 years. Uh, they, this is one of the things that's rebuilt. Now, of course, Gowan was the president. The architect, probably Byers, actually. Byers, that's probably the last building he ever uh, managed. And then his second in command is Wilhelm Lorenz. And there's inside Chestnut Hill. By the way, if you, anybody out here is a model railroader, I'd say in 1940, Edwin, Al, Edwin P. Alexander 
did a book about model railroads. I remember him actually. Uh, I, I got a lot of material from him. In fact, some of which is actually in this show. But he picked as the perfect little model railroad yard you could do, like in HO models, Cheston Hill. He could have picked anywhere, anywhere in the United States, because this book was sold all over. But he said, no, Cheston Hill is perfect. You got this nice little roundhouse, five stall engine house, there it is. In fact, the Cheston Hill yard actually looks like a model railroad. It's perfect. You could do it on like a big dining room table almost, and it would look terrific. But there it is in 1930, photographed by Ed Alexander. Coming into the yard, the building on the right, possible, might have been the original engine house, a little one-staller. And then the five-stall engine house was built in 1884. Here's just a few locomotives that made their way in there. This one was built by Baldwin, but way back in 1854. And in fact, that was on the roster even into the Reading era. It was named the Superior, but I know that was on the PG&N. This you would have seen all during the 80s and 90s, early 1900s. It's called a camelback. They got a wide firebox back there to burn anthracite coal, right? In fact, the cheaper version of it. They didn't waste anything. And there it is on a handheld turntable at Cheston Hill. And this is in the Cheston Hill station, right into little sheds there with the crew. A little later, this would be in the early 30s, a uh, bigger camelback coming out of the yard. They even designed this whopping big tank engine. They built a ton of them specifically for Cheston Hill. In fact, that way they didn't even have to use a turntable. It was a short run. So it's 10.8 miles from Reading Terminal to Cheston Hill. Okay, 10.8. The Pensy line is exactly 12 miles from Broad Street Station. They could run up. They didn't need that much coal. And because it's upgrade, it's tough going up, but they could practically drift going back. And that lasted for maybe 30 years till 1930. There's a steamer coming out of the yard. Right under that bridge, as a matter of fact, that I took in 1979. There's the electric yard in 79. And this is when they're taking down the old station. The 1871 station uh, is actually, they, they built the new station literally in the airspace. And you can see the outer wall just about on the left there in both photos. This is happening during 1931. And then and now, there's the advertisement for the electrics vacation. Those are the green MU cars. And there's a photograph to die for. That is Frank Tattnall's photo shot on the 26th of December, 1960. And we were on the walk Back in April, right, Alex Bartlett is standing up there. He says, oh, there was a time you could actually photograph here. Now it's all overgrown. But there it was in 1960, 59 years ago, by Frank. And it, it's actually also the best broadside I've ever seen of those things, the green MU cars. The Pensies are red, the Reddings are green. And that used to be the reservoir in the foreground. Now, Rick Bates sent me, oh, some incredible material, photographically, information uh, that he dug out, absolutely priceless at Reading Technical Historical. These are various photos of the green MU cars representing the Reading's electric uh, electrification starting in the 30s, 31, 32, 33, I think, is when it was actually opened. And this, oh, John Bowen, what a beautiful shot in 1960 of Graver's Lane. And that is before the shed came down, by the way, before. Perfect shot. Couldn't be better. Low angle, just, just perfect. So there's what they looked like. There's at, uh, Graver's on the right and the Mount Airy on the left. Winmore. And now, a little then and now, there's the station today, as finished. And there it is in 1979. Sorry, not a very good shot by me. There's Bethlehem Pike. And this is kind of a neo-Gothic. Some people call it collegiate Gothic. And you're looking down the street at the old station and comparing it, Bethlehem Pike, then and now, look at that gas station, Texaco. There you go. Love that touring car. I mean, I would just sit there and mesmerize over those things. 
and there it is, actually in 1970, and that's pretty much the end of the photos. I just want to show you, these books have been priceless. Okay, the Liz Jarvis books, uh, these Arcadia books, Mount Airy, Chestnut Hill, Chestnut Hill Revisited, a lot of stuff about the houses and the whole ambiance. There's another one by uh, Judith Kaylard, I think her name is. And there we have the, um, the 1973 catalog from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, an exhibit of Frank Furness. That is his big comeback. George Thomas, uh, O'Gorman, what's his first name? I can't remember, Gorman, and uh, High Myers. All collaborated on that. I still think that's one of the best written in terms of describing his work. The other one in the middle, Frank Furness, uh, Architecture in the Violent Mind. And there's the new George Thomas book. And also material from Reading Technical, Historical Society, and so forth and so on. These are absolutely must have. And I guess that would be it. You gonna have questions? Question? I don't know. Question and answer? Anything like that? Is that what, is that right to say? I don't know. Okay. Anyone have questions? Question? Yeah. I was going to point out. Uh, yeah. Talk about the uh, electric and new cars. Yes. The newest of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Yeah, well, and the, and the Pensy cars were based on a plan that was really even much older than that. Yeah. The old original P-54, actually, yeah. Question, yeah. I just wanted to give Septa credit for rebuilding that bridge over Allen's Lane. You said it looks better than ever before. It it's does. Like, well, since yeah. it's new. They oh, brand new. To okay. All right, but to the, apparently to the same plants. I don't think they deviated it, or did they? Were there any changes? It seems like the radius is about the same. Yeah, by the way, there used to be one at Allen's Lane. I don't know if it's still there. Or not Allen's Lane, uh, Queen Lane, excuse me. But it's straight. Only the one at Allen's has that beautiful curvature. But that's 1912. It wasn't as built originally. Not when the station was new. Any other questions? Yeah. Three quick points. Yeah. First of all, excellent presentation. Thank you. Second of all, having grown up in between Sedgwick and Mount Airy, yeah. I have 50 stories that I'm not going to get into. <laughs> but you have them. You have them. That's the main thing. Yeah, I have. Yeah, right. You want, to, you want to get those out in written or even oral form because that's the only way we'll preserve this. I've run out of time. Love it. But one good question. Yeah. The, the electrification. Yes. Is the power on both lines the same? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's out of my depth. The answer is yes. Yeah, it's twelve thousand volts. So okay. Uh, AC. Uh, the same on the right. That, that's why septic can run trains through from one side of the system to the other. Okay. There, there's a phase break in between them. But the one thing about the electric that I forgot to mention, the Chestnut Hill line, if you don't count the electric into Penn Station in New York, which opened in 1910, from Manhattan transfer under the Hudson River into the tunnel, that's a third rail DC pickup thing. If you don't count that, the Chestnut Hill electrification for the Pennsylvania Railroad is really their second commuter electrification, the first one being on the main line Philly to Paoli. The Paoli local starts in 1915, but very shortly after. In fact, during World War I is the Pensy electrification. Now, that didn't mean there were no steam engines up here. It may be that they got rid of the turntable at Chestnut Hill and the Iron Shed. There were still freight trains that had steam. 
and other special movements, but the normal passenger trains were electric. Um, by the way, it was, it's 38 minutes from Broad Street Station to Cheston Hill, and believe it or not, I just checked the timetable, it is still 38 minutes for the 12 miles from Suburban. It's the same, okay? And for the Reading, uh, it's, it fluctuates. It's about 30, and you have to remember long ago when they were running on 9th Street, they had a five mile an hour speed limit when they ran down on the street level. Later, when they elevated the track in the viaduct in 1910, they can move a lot faster. But that's just a little insight. Yeah. Uh, 